The Red Lions is the parachute display team of the Singapore Armed Forces. To do display parachuting, you need to be very proficient in your military free fall. They are the cream of the crop. Two five two BSC. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Niu Chun Chie. Here is where we turn you all into airborne troopers. You all will jump out of a plane from 1,000 feet. Oh, how high is that? 300 meters. Special Operations Tactical Support Center, or SOTSC in short, is responsible for training our commando forces and uh, special forces in parachuting skills such as Static line parachuting, military free fall parachuting, which is required for our commandos to do their airborne operations. Static line parachuting is typically done at lower altitudes, typically about a thousand feet, and the parachute will automatically deploy after the parachutist jumps out from the aircraft. This enables the deployment of large forces quickly. On the other hand, for Military free fall parachuting, the parachutist jumps out from greater altitudes. It allows the parachutists to fly a greater distance and infiltrate their targets stealthily. It's my duty to tell you that airborne course is going to be mentally and physically intensive. Take care of yourself, take care of your bodies, take care of your equipment. All your equipment will serve you will protect you. So parachuting involves a high level of skill and of course a high level of risk as well. So we need our instructors to have a certain level of experience, be very competent to be able to train the airborne trainees to a high level of competency and confidence before they are jumping out of the aircraft. It's unlike other training where the trainee doesn't do so well, you can stop the training. But for parachuting, once the trainee is out of the aircraft, he is by his own. Good landing position. Airborne. Toes to toes. Yes. Tuck in your chin, hands up your elbows in, and push. One more time. I want you to throw your hip and push, and recover. I'm First Oran Eugene Cho. I'm a chief trainer in the centre. Back right. Boom! Push and over. And recover. In the airborne training facility, we are going to teach the trainees PLF parachute landing for. Landing is important because 80% of the injuries come from bad landing. We have cases like sprained ankle, fractured ankles, or uh, even uh, landing on their backs. In this airborne training facility, we have airborne training system. We can get our students to jump out a simulator out from the aircraft. The instructor on the ground will give the trainee the instructions to execute different drills based on different scenarios. They are able to execute their flight emergency steering. They also can able to execute their collision drills they will execute a lowering down of their combat equipment. And thereafter, then they will execute their landing. They are executing a day and a night ATS. 
commandos are red specialists of the armed forces. So they typically operate in the cover of darkness and infiltrate the enemy territory uh, using various uh, means uh, by land, uh, by sea or by airborne insertions. They have to start from the basics, which is static line parachuting. So through basic airborne course, they get qualified in static line parachuting. After that, they still have to go through a series of advanced parachuting courses and instructional courses which can take anywhere from four to eight years before they can even be eligible to be a Red Lion. The Red Lions is the parachute display team of the Singapore Armed Forces. We do display jumps for National Day Parade and uh, service open houses uh, such as Army Open House. The Red Lions team members are highly trained military field force instructors. They are the cream of the cream of the crop. Very good morning, team. Our mission is to execute the safe build-up training and rehearsals culminating in the Red Lions display jump at Padang on 9th August as part of the NDP show segment. A preview of our mission target, the Padang. Oh, it's a very small drop zone, measuring 108 meters by 78 meters, surrounded by the spectator stands, the National Gallery in front, and the trees near the St. Andrew's Cathedral. So it's very intense schedule, eh? leading up to the final show on 9th August. It's going to take weeks and weeks away from your family, months of training and preparation. It'll be tough. The Great Lions jump is an intense commitment. The size of the team depends on the NDP concept of the year and also the size of the show location. We have shortlisted 12 of the most experienced and uh, highly skilled Red Lions to undergo further training and to let us configure the best team for this year's event. Not all of us will be in the final team. Eventually, we are looking at a team of eight I'm Second Warren Shirley Ng, SAF Parachute Rigger. Riggers generally are the ones who pack and maintain the parachutes for the formations. It's my first full-time job, so I, I know nothing about this job, seriously. All I know is I have the opportunity to jump. To be able to fly is always my childhood dream. Okay, to complete the packing of the parachute, there's several stages. So every stage got to go through a second layer of check. I would say the flipping of gauze is the most tiring one because when the street is with tension, every line that you pick up to flip, you need a certain amount of strength. So imagine you flip 30 lines each parachute and one day you pack eight parachutes. That means you have to flip 240 times. And if you pack five days in a week, it's like thousand over times. Regus doesn't have pretty fingers. Uh. You look at how she stole the suspension lines. Every store got to double wrap the retainer band. Actually, the fingers is quite painful. To achieve my jumping dreams, uh, I need to complete the three-month Regus course, then after that, followed by an airborne course. This course, actually, we need to take the parachute that we pack and jump. My first jump wasn't very enjoyable because so many things to look out. You need to look out for other jumpers. Hey, where are you? Where's the wind direction? Basically, you see nothing. You only see your canopy and where you want to land. Uh, that's about it. So it's like you got no chance to see scenery. We got 1,000 feet to the ground. It's actually quite fast. It's like less than a minute. Then after, when you got more and more experience in jumping, then you will start to enjoy the view. La. Oh, that is where, this is where, and that is where. La. The 
the parachute that the Red Lion use is a square canopy, which you can jump 10,000 feet and higher. We are here for the wind tunnel training. After we exit out for the aircraft, before we deploy our parachutes, the period of time that we need to control our maneuvers, this is where we practice. This is a simulation of the free falling. With this, we learn how to manoeuvre, whether left turn, right turn, forward, backward, up or down. If they are going for an insertion operation, sometimes they have to position themselves very near to each other. That's why manoeuvring in the air is important. If they can't control, they may have collision. There's altogether belly fly, back fly, seat fly, and head down. So I'm still a learner. I'm learning head down now. Usually, we go for two minutes per person because two minutes is enough to check you out. <laughs> a lot of different sets of muscle use. Uh. Hey, I'm um, the Warren Jeffrey Heng. 2022, I was the cameraman for Red Lion. When I'm coming down for my landing, I experienced this sudden gust of uh, wind. Uh. And bringing up the rear, third warrant officer Jeffrey Hang. I was pushed away from my design landing direction. And let's kill the. Today we are here for the basic airborne course. They are cocking their first jump today. I'm the Warren Jeffrey Heng, the trainer here. I was tasked to conduct the basic airborne course. Personally, I like to share my knowledge to people that are willing to learn. To be in a commando is one of my ambitions. After I watch all those movies, Garang Garang, at the same time, I get to parachute. I want to get myself trained so that I can live my passion. Two two two. I was the cameraman for Red Lion. I was tasked to take all the footage in the air. All the rehearsal, this, the jump. You plan how we're going to jump out, how we're going to fly our canopy, all this are already discussed and planned. And most of the time, we, we work towards it. So it's manageable. Lah. The actual day, you know, jump out. Formation now, John. This Everything was as planned. Lah. So I took the footage get behind a stack and fly canopy to the desired impact point. And bringing up the rear, third warrant officer Jeffrey Heng. When I'm coming down for my landing, I experience this sudden gust of wind. The wind might have uh, deflected from uh, the spectator stance. They hit onto me. Yeah. I was pushed away from my design landing direction. When I realized that in front of me is all my teammates, so I made the decision to steer my canopy to slightly to the right end.
and that's good up. Are you all right? I'm okay. Thank you. Can you share with me what was going through your mind? Yeah. <laughs> What's going through my mind? Oh. Uh, I... Not come to say that. Yeah. With this incident, like it, won't, it won't stop me. Like. It won't stop me from parachute. But with this, Incident, I learned more, and with the, you know, the parachute learning for any situation being thrown to you, as long you're able to land properly, you're able to survive. So I was uh, boarded to SGH for three weeks. I injured my back, fractured my tailbone. During the scares, you know, my concern is, am I able to parachute again? Yeah. So, I'm happy that when the doctor told me that it's minor fracture, that I don't require any surgery. And the doctor also assured me that I can be healed up uh, within a year. So, that's keep me going. It took me about nine months for me to get back to work. So my aim for this year is to fully recover and make sure that I'm proficient for the jama. So it's 6 a.m. in the morning and uh, we are going to San Diego to enhance our canopy piloting skills. I'm feeling sad. This is an early morning flight, so um, my kids were still asleep when I left, so I could only kiss them goodbye when I left. I travel a lot for work. Yeah, I always get this feeling when I travel. And it, it doesn't get better. Lah. In fact, it gets worse the more I travel. But they left me some sweet notes, and this is from my youngest. She said, I love you, Daddy, so, so much. And of course, they are shopping lists. to Skydive San Diego. Hopefully you brought some sunshine with you. This is uh, the wettest winter since 1862. We are currently in this building here. All right, and of course we have the airfield. Generally, we take off in a westerly direction. We ascend over to the lake and then we'll turn around, coming up in this direction and then come around for jump run. As with any new places we go, uh, we have to do a drop zone orientation where we get familiar with all the layouts and the hazards on the ground. Learn how to recognise the landing approach, the landmarks. So it's just a normal exit from 13,000 feet. The thrilling part is the moment you exit. It's a leap of faith in it. It's the step out of the aircraft that gives you the confidence. So I go out, boom. Eh, the world becomes so quiet. The time becomes so long. That's when the fun kicks in. Uh. We have different profiles of jumpers here. For the more seasoned Red Lions, they exit the aircraft in a group formation. They will break off and deploy at their designated altitudes. The main focus is still orientation to the drop zone. Good 
We went to 13,000 feet. It's very cold. I need to change my glove. I'm full of adrenaline. Until now, it's still my hand shiver. With every first jump, there'll be some anxiety. Every new drop zone, there's a lot of unknowns. Typically, we want to land against the wind so that it slows down the forward speed. But there's some uh, slight crosswinds. Uh, that means the wind's coming from the side. So you might notice some of us being swept a bit sideways when we landed. But that's part of our training. Uh, we get used to different conditions on the ground. You all managed to spot the DZ? Yes. Yeah, actually quite quite easy to spot. Yeah. But it's quite a spectacular view from the top uh, because you can see the whole lake. The lake and the mountain. Seriously, I was too cold to enjoy the view. Yeah, man. I just couldn't wait to come down. Okay, yeah, we'll meet here one hour later. Today is a rest day, but I've got a few things to buy for my wife. Duty uh, every time going overseas. So I have to make up to her. I'm actually looking for some toys that uh, my kids ask me to buy. Every trip, they give me a shopping list. So I have three girls. Each of them have their own preference. Uh. Olivia wants koala stuff. If not, get unicorn toys. Or Sam wants uh, anything blue colour. And uh, Anna wants a doggy puppy toy. Uh, looks like... Don't have it. <laughs> then, what happens if you can't find any? Wow, oh, I think by the end of the trip, I better find something. If not, they'll be terribly upset. Yeah, I think I found one for my youngest. She wanted a doggy puppy toy. Okay, at least one down. A little intro on myself, uh, Chad Ross. Um, I've been jumping for 20 years now, coming up on 22,000 skydives. We're gonna be focusing on introducing more techniques and overall shooting for more and more accurate landings as we do so. Military 3-4 instructors use uh, sports parachutes when they instruct their military 3-4 trainees during a course. Yeah, so they need to be proficient in handling of these sports parachutes. So, canopy piloting course is actually part of our formal sports parachuting training for instructors, not just for Red Lions, but this also enhances their skills to carry out display jumps for Red Lions. We engage international renowned coach. We can tap into the larger parachuting expert network. US is a very established parachuting fraternity. On this first jump, what I want you guys to do, and probably done this in the past, but I want you guys to get a feel for bringing that stall surge in, and I want you to hold it a little bit longer than you feel like you should. The goal being that I want to feel myself raise up, load the harness, right? And where I would normally smoothly release to generate the dive, I want you to feel that point where you're starting to rock back. Through the program, we introduce advanced techniques, uh, such as we introduce ways in which we can generate more speed, make their canopy piloting more efficient in all terrain, all wind conditions, and all scenarios. All my focus is on the drill itself. Actually, Anxiety, adrenaline is there. 
Very nervous. Hope I can do all the things that he actually wants us to do. Once you've hit that, I would just focus on your landing pattern so we're not adding anything in. There are 10 of us taking the canopy piloting course, but we are split into two groups. We have two instructors. Each instructor will follow one group. And there's another instructor actually at the ground to film our landing. We are jumping out of the aircraft at 5,000 feet. I count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and I deploy my parachute. So that's how we created the safety distance of each jumper. Most probably 1,000 feet. So the second jumper then exit out. Usually the heaviest one or the one that descend faster will jump first. So, and canopy deployed, there will be a good safety distance in between jumpers. If not, they will have collusion. The US canopy pilot course, right, I learned about tolerance of the canopy. When I pull brakes, when I hold it there, will the canopy collapse? For example, when the whole canopy collapsed, it will drop for a certain height. We really did all the extreme thing at a very high height. We test it up so that we will know not to overdo it. Then we can better and confidently execute our drills properly. I didn't know that I can have various techniques to actually to make a turn. They call it the harness turn. Instead of we are always using our toggles to make turns, we just need to shift our body weight to either side that you want to go. After I land, definitely first thing I'll collapse my canopy. The next thing I will turn around to watch out for other jumpers that are coming down to land. Then at the same time, I will stow my brakes. The brakes means the control line that we use to steer. After I stow my brakes, the traffic is clear, I will collect my canopy and walk to the backers area and lay out my canopy nicely, straight, then for the backers to ready to pack. All right, you guys. How's your guys' second jump? Awesome. Good. Good. Training overseas, our coach will give us a debrief. They'll show us our videos and tell us which are the areas to improve on. Then we'll immediately go for the next jump. We get to do multiple jumps in a day. So the learning is very effective this way. And then as you're coming in, you've got a, a bit of right pull to the canopy. So you can see that direct correlation of just the slight asymmetry in the harness cause that 15 degrees off. Singapore, our local airspace is uh, very constrained. We are contending with the commercial uh, airline and the Air Force. We can only do one jump in like two to three months. So if there's any things we need to improve on, we could only wait two to three months later, then we work on it. I'm prepping my gears for the jump later. I already put on my jumpsuit, my helmet, this is my Altimeter, this put on on my wrist to show me how I'm in during my free fall. It shows what altitude you need to deploy your parachute. Like we will be jumping off at 10,000 feet, then we will be deploying our shoe at 5,000 feet. So it shows you that you have to deploy a parachute. In. And we have an alternative one, this one is the audible. So at 5,000 feet, you will peep. It's a secondary reminder for you in case you never observe your altimeter. I'm ready for checks. Focus on, focus on. Second check, please. 
for the army practices, we will always have two checks before we board the airplane. It's a double layer of safety. As with any training, the jumps are very progressive. Once we are familiar with the maneuver or training, we progress to the next jump. When we learn a new technique, we have all these repetitive jumps to keep reinforcing all this learning so that it can be in tune now with our instinct. If you are making a left turn, do remind to look at your left side of the traffic to see if there's anybody with your same height coming in. And you see people on your path, give them a shout, let them know you're coming. So at least they can look up and be aware of it. So we have uh, various groups that come together for this training. The canopy piloting group, the tandem group, that military free fall instructor training to become a tandem instructor. We have this FFTG group, free fall training group. And these are the aspiring instructors. This group of people will one day also become red lines. Check your leg. Your leg. Your leg. Your leg. Your leg. Using your leg to do the setup, right? Out in, out, right? Okay, check your angle of your body. Uh, inside, make sure your body is facing out the way. I'm mentoring this FFTG group, free fall training group. I will take a look at their ground preparation before they board the aircraft. See if there's any pointers I can give to them. In skydiving, there's a few phases. There's a free fall phase. When the student jumps out of the aircraft, there is a moment where we call it a forward throw where the student falls at the rates of the speed of the aircraft, 200 kilometers per hour, for example, your speed will slowly slow down. And that will take you about six seconds. You will start to free fall downwards, and you will start to pick up speed. And to a point where it's called terminal velocity, where it falls constantly at a rate where it will not increase anymore. Your fall rate can range between 180 to maybe up to 280 kilometers per hour. At the same time, there's a lot of air resistance coming up. And with the resistance, you almost feel like something is supporting you. All manoeuvres can be done above the pool height. The term pool height means it comes to a point where you need to deploy your parachute, lowest by 4,000 feet. Baseline for all military free fall jumps. A very fundamental way of landing is always land into the wind. So there's resistance. And when you break, there's a uh, breaking power there. The more jumps you have, you need to land nearer to the target. So for here, you can see where the person is standing, right in front of the chevron. This is where their target is. What they'll do is record down how far they are off from the chevron, the direction and the distance, so they can improve along the way. It's not as simple because of the wind condition. It changes most of the time. Sometimes it's tricky because as you're aiming for the centre, suddenly you get this wind, right? It actually is, prevents you from moving forward. Probably they fall back behind. And these are some of the challenges they face. Yes, sir. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Normally, after training, when we have a time, we will maintain our fitness. I'm first Warren Chueng saying, I'm attending the tandem instructor course. Definitely, I felt a little bit excited. It's very different jumping alone or even with your combat equipment versus jumping with a real person strapped to you. 3,000 feet is the lowest altitude that you should be deploying your reserve. 
above 4,000 feet, you're just going to try to go normal with everything else. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. We are currently having a tandem instructor course. This is the first time I'm attending this course. After graduating from this course, we'll be able to tandem a passenger. Definitely more challenging than flying alone as a solo jumper. To attend the tandem instructor course, you must have 500 jumps at least in the free fall jump. To clock the 500 jump is really a very long journey. I have uh, 670 jumps currently. I first jumped free fall in uh, year 2000. So until now it's uh, 23 years. This is just like a passenger. It could seem to get off to one side or the other. You need to arch and fly your body and keep it in front of you. You can tactically jump in an interpreter or a dog or one time a surgeon or medical support. So there's a lot of reasons why you would want to have a military tandem program to be able to insert somebody that doesn't know how to jump. I did a jump in a foreign country where we jumped out at about 30,000 feet, opened our parachutes four to six seconds after leaving the ramp of the aircraft, and flew for about 60 miles under parachutes. So the idea of jumping out in the United States and landing in Mexico with the Mexican government never knowing that we're there, it could be done. And you can be at an altitude where they don't know your plane is there or they can't see your plane. And then you can open low enough to where they spend a small amount of time flying your parachute so that you're not detected. You're never seen on radar. Anything in your pockets? Nope. Got any necklaces? Do you have contacts? No. I'm uh, going for the jump as a passenger with my instructor. Are you ready? I'm ready. OK, that's good. Great. Who's hanging on, you or me? Uh, me. OK, good. Don't let go. When the parachute opens, just relax. You don't have to do anything. I'm going to control the parachute. I'll fly us back towards the drop zone, and I'm going to loosen these side attachment points because we don't need them anymore. Currently, I'm going through the tandem instructor course. The instructor will tandem us. As a passenger, you don't have much control. Everything has to depend on the instructor. So it felt very restricted. The whole reason of this is to let us have a feel as a passenger. And next time when I take a passenger, how would he feel? Next, I'll be jumping the tandem parachute system and bring the passenger down. It's a cosmic. There's a progression. Once we knock it out, 25 jump onwards, like we can take anyone who is not trained or any jumper. So once we board the aircraft, we have to bring them to their seat and then strap them down with the safety belt. And then we have to hook them up at a certain height. Definitely more complication because you have to hook up the passenger to you and now you have to be responsible for a life in front of you. Then we bring him to the exit door and then we will exit together and try to be as stable as possible. The free fall was fun and then it's just very different trying to free fall with additional personnel. It was a good job. Everything went according to plan. Did what I was supposed to do and bring the passenger down. I've been out of action for more than about nine months, so I need to get back my currency to back in the air. 
to ensure that jumpers stay relevant and be provisioned for your given four months to stay current. If the jumper currency expired, you will need to attend a refresher training, which I include the wind tunnel to get him ready for the recurrency jump. Recurrency jump uh, is a live jump. You will need to jump out from a live aircraft to get back currency. Today will be your free fall refresher training. So just remember your eight point of motion. It will be your left turn, right turn, forward, back. Looking forward to get back my currency and hopefully I able to arch and, and be stable in the air. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out whether uh, I able to arch. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah, able to arch. So the first session without a parachute, one minute, 30 seconds is given just to achieve this uh, eight point motion. The eight point of motion is a requirement for all refresher training to make sure that the, the jumper, when up in the air, able to make the basic right, left, turn up, down, and move away from any obstruction. So actually, I took about 30 seconds to finish all this. So the rest of the time actually is for my own uh, uh, skill enhancement, like back flying, all this thing, transition. Because uh, too long, I never jump really. So I want to try, it's just a self-check for myself. Actually, it's not physical tiring. Man. I'm still able to hack it. It's just that probably uh, too long, never do. <laughs> so a bit uh, excited. We will move on to your parachute. Same thing again will be your eight point of motion. I did the eight point of motion. It's more of a muscle memory. Like. So when you fly many times, you're able to control where you want to go. I'll be looking forward to the coming recurrency jump. I'll be jumping out of an aircraft physically uh, to, to get back my currency. Surely. All right, so getting onto your fronts from the stall surge. Good job with that harness. Your turn's really smooth. It's looking good. I think we're we're getting to a position where we can start to bump that down. Lower. Just a little bit lower, not a ton, but let's start to stair step that down. Once we felt that everyone was very smooth, concise, and consistent with the drill work, we moved into phase two, which is proximity flying. This is where you fly next to another individual in a specified formation, but in a very close, finite atmosphere. It's actually new to me because we are always taught in a way that we should keep a good separation between canopies. It was quite scary because the canopy is so close to you. You don't know how you're going to react. Will you get into a wrap? Will you get into a collusion or what? So after a few times, you get comfortable. So you actually wanted to get closer and closer. Uh, that is when the coaches will add in more jumpers. So the idea is, like, imagine you're driving a car and you're on a four-lane road by yourself. It doesn't matter what you're doing. The speed doesn't matter. You could be swerving all over the place. Now add another car. And add another car. And add another car. So it forces you to become a much more aware driver, and it forces you to become a much more efficient driver. I think the end of the day, in seeing another canopy that is so close to me, I know how to react, I know how to read from their canopy's behavior. It actually builds your own confidence level in flying close with other jumpers. We find ourselves the uh, culmination of two weeks of really 
heavy jumping. We've seen a tremendous amount of progression. And without further ado, we do have our certificates of completion that we would like to hand out individually. The U.S. training definitely gave us a valuable experience and allowed us to attain our required qualifications and for uh, the guys to build their jump knowledge and skill sets. But the training doesn't stop here. With NDP nearing, the next training focus will be on building the team's proficiency and uh, synergy as we uh, prepare for the NDP display jumps. Padang is a class one drop zone. The highest difficulty. This year, NDP display, the standard is race. It's not easy to achieve. 